3D bioprinting in combination with uh, human-induced pluripotent stem cells derived from patients suffering from Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, as well as glioblastoma, to print these personalized 3D tissue models that we can use for drug screening. Uh, since this is a 3D Heals webinar, I think everyone's pretty much familiar with 3D printing, um, the traditional one. So there's a 3D printed axolotl. Um, where you have a CAD file that's your design, and then you have a printer that melts a filament that then gets extruded into the shape you desire. And uh, bioprinting is similar, um, except you're actually bioprinting uh, the cells. And one of the areas our lab has really been an expert in um, is in making really good bioinks for printing these human tissue models. And uh, we most of the time focus on printing neural tissues. And uh, with the guys at Aspect, we actually um, published uh, this current opinion piece uh, in 2020 discussing uh, the state of the art for bioprinting healthy and disease models of brain tissue. And so while our lab uh, has used them mainly as a tool to study uh, potential drugs and their effects on the nervous system, um, I do know companies like Aspect and I think um, Fluid Farm have actually been looking at bioprinting as a tool to actually put therapeutic tissues into patients as well. So uh, things to think about when you want to bioprint. One is the method of printing. As I said, we've been really lucky in my lab because we've got a number of different bioprinters. Um, uh, so are you using an extrusion system? Are you going to need a photopolymerizable bioink? And so those are all things to consider. What resolution can your printer print? Um, what kind of structure can it print? Uh, another big consideration is what cells do you want to print? Uh, for us, when we um, print our tissues, we print at a pretty high cell density, usually around a million cells per mil, which is similar to the density of cells you'd find in the body. So some of the considerations are how do you get that number of cells? Um, stem cells tend to be a bit more delicate to print compared to some of the primary cells. So you need to figure out sort of what your printing conditions are to keep your cells both alive and functioning um, in the manner they would in your body. Uh, another thing is your consideration of the bioink that you actually use with your 3D printing system because the easiest materials to print aren't what's necessarily best for cells. Um, the tissue structure, uh, bioinks tend to be a little bit more finicky to work with than traditional plastics. So sometimes you need to do some trial and error to see if the structure you're making um, can actually be printed. And finally, do and incorporate growth and differentiation factors uh, to mature your tissues. And if anybody's interested in learning more about natural bioinks, my research group, uh, Claire um, is one of Claire and Becker, my current grad student students. They wrote a review paper on natural biomaterials um, that came out in bioengineering, uh, I think in January, 2021. And I think it's been cited 20 times since it came out. So if you wanna learn more about it, that's what I would suggest reading. Um, so the work I'll be talking about today was done with Aspects Biosystems Lab on a Printer um, system, which you can see here. This is one of their older print heads. I'll actually be talking with them about some of the work using one of their newer print heads. Um, so these are essentially microfluidic devices that extrude different materials and cell types to print complex tissues. And they had a paper come out in uh, the Facepi Journal um, in 2020, where they actually published their um, artificial uh, smooth uh, muscle airway technology, which is really kind of interesting. I think Jenny Chen and I actually met at Aspect Biosystems um, conference they had printing the future of therapeutics in 3D, which I think is coming back to us this year as well. So uh, one of the things that we really liked about the system is because of the high nature degree of control you have over the flow rates, it's actually very gentle on cells. And so we were able to print our delicate stem cells with relatively um, high rates of viability, partially due to um, the technology that they've been using. It's also fun because you can switch materials, which can in theory allow you to print some complex um, tissues as well. So our lab spent a lot of time developing a fibrin-based bioink, which we have now commercialized through my company, Axolotl Biosciences, um, that I'm the CEO of and one of the co-founders. Um, and so it's actually commercially available and it's called tissue print. And you can actually see tissue print in action in the middle of this slide. Um, and when we initially published our formulation of tissue print, uh, it was, in, it was uh, featured as one of the 2019 methods of the year in ACS Biomaterial Science and Engineering. Since then, we've used tissue print to print a variety of tissues, um, as you can see with all of our different publications. Um, although it was originally developed for neural through our beta testing network with Axolotl, um, we found it's really good at printing bone and cardiac and um, a wide variety of cell types. And uh, if you want to learn more, you can read our papers. Um, we also have a version that's not published, that's different, that works very well with the selling systems as well. So yeah, if you're interested in trying out our, our ink, uh, definitely feel free to, to reach out. 
So the first uh, type of bioprinting I just wanted to talk briefly about today was some work done by uh, one of my co-founders at Axolotl, my former superstar PhD student, uh, Dr. Laura De La Vega. So uh, this paper, which came out in Advanced Nanobiomed Research, um, we actually used 3D bioprinting to print essentially functional mini spinal cords, which was super cool. Um, and so in addition to our base uh, ink that we call tissue print, in this case, we actually incorporated in drug releasing microspheres. Uh, that would slowly release the small molecules permorphamine and retinoic acid over time. And because it, it by having them in the, the ink, one, it cuts down on your need to change your media. You get nice, slow, controlled uh, release of the factors. And also the cells actually seem to really like having um, the microspheres present. So I think there's some mechanobiology going on there as well. Here's just some of the, the data. So we were essentially printing little round uh, cylinders to mimic the spinal cord, as you can see here. Um, these extrude as fibers that we then print into the cylindrical shape. So that's what you're seeing here is the different fibers that make up the constructs. We had four different groups, uh, a negative control, a positive control where we added soluble um, small molecules to the media. Um, we also had a group where we had the unloaded microspheres present in our inks. So that's what these little red arrowheads are pointing to are the um, drug releasing microspheres both in the unloaded case and then the ones that were actually loaded with drug. So uh, Laura went ahead and stained these different groups. So what, one of the things that's really interesting about these tissue models um, is that they contained astrocytes, as you can see here in red, uh, indicated by GFAP staining. And they also had um, motor neurons as indicated by CHAT staining, which is the blue you can see here, as well as uh, beta tubulin 3, which is a neuronal marker as well. And so while they had similar levels of chat expression, uh, the different groups had different levels of um, HB9, which is an early motor neuron marker. And so this suggested that um, actually our microsphere group was probably maturing the tissues at a faster rate um, compared to just having these uh, soluble, the um, small molecules in the media. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to point out is, so this was, um, we were able to keep these constructs around for 30 and 45 days, which is really helpful and, and is quite long and terms of uh, bioprinted tissues, because if we actually do want to use them for drug screening, you want to be able to keep them around and actually use them to, to monitor things. These cells also, uh, our tissues actually also express myelin, which is a mature oligodendrocyte marker. And I think this is the first time anyone had published a neural tissue, a bioprinted neural tissue from stem cells where you actually did see myelin expression. And GAB is a neurotransmitter um, as well. So we're getting relatively mature tissues here um, as well. And finally, Laura used voltage sensitive dyes um, to see if our tissues were uh, producing electrical activity and they were. So this was also quite exciting. So um, we had the tissues at rest and we measured sort of their voltage potential and then we treated them with neurotransmitters designed to get them to uh, activate these um, membrane potentials. And we were able to then inhibit them uh, using inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters as well. So this was kind of, this was really exciting because having a functional neural tissue means that if we wanted to screen drugs, we could see if it's actually going to be uh, ne uh, induced neurotoxicity uh, in addition to just cell viability. And while I'm not going to show it today, um, some of our, our recent work we're actually getting ready to submit, we've actually seen, um, we can track amyloid beta um, and tau expression in our Alzheimer's tissue models, which again gives us a readout for drug screening. And more, most recently, uh, my PhD student, Uchi, who's looking to defend soon, she actually was able to observe Lewy bodies, which is one of the characteristics of Parkinson's and our Parkinson's tissues. Um, and so, yeah, essentially we have uh, neural tissues that have all the different cell types present. And I think this is a really relevant model for drug screening purposes, just given that we can measure their electrical activity as well. So uh, fresh, fresh uh, accepted work uh, from our collaboration with Ryan Flanagan's group over at the Vancouver Prostate Center, which is part of the University of British Columbia. Uh, we've been 3D bioprinting personalized testicular tubules. So his, he works as a, a doctor looking at infertility and looks at the different mechanisms that contribute to patients who are unable to produce sperm, as well as um, ways to potentially get around this, which include um, bioprinting these testicular tubules from sperm stem cells. So uh, in this case, he did a patient biopsy um, from one of his uh, patients, and then he did a comparison um, with how they make these uh, 3D testicular organoids, which fits very well with the theme of today's um, session. Uh, so the interesting thing, while these patients can't produce mature sperm, they do have these sperm stem cells. And so the idea is, can we use these sperm stem cells to sort of recreate the microenvironment to potentially create some organoids that would generate functional sperm? 
So, um, and this was done by Megan Robinson, who previously worked for me and is now his current lab manager. And she used the Aspect uh, Bioprinter as well. But in this case, she used one of their newer models of print heads, the coaxial print head called the Sintra. And you can see here, these are the different designs she printed. And interestingly enough, she used this core shell structure to print these testicular tubules. And you can see that these cells had pretty high viability. So uh, interestingly enough, when she compared these to the organoids, um, she saw increases in the amount of genes uh, associated with spermatogenesis. And so this actually seems like it might be a better way to get at potentially making these, um, replicating the testicular niche as compared to just having a uh, traditional uh, testicular organoid. And then she also looked at the um, meiotic and post-meiotic gene expression after 12 days. And uh, as I mentioned, this paper was just recently accepted um, at FNS Science. So we're, we're really excited for it to come out. And again, just uh, to show you a, a bit of a little bit of a comparison. So here you can see with the um, bioprinted testicular structures, you can clearly see the core shell when they've been stained um, here. And then these are the actual organoids. So again, you're getting um, more of a rounded structure when you're having them. And again, she was staining them for the markers that you would find in these structures um, in vivo and comparing some of the expression. But since these are actually tubules um, in vivo, uh, it seems to be easier to replicate the structure with bioprinting compared to just having the standard self-organizing organoid form. Uh, so with that, as Jenny said, we have uh, founded a company and we actually are currently raising money um, as well. We're currently raising around um, our company, Axolotl Biosciences. We have our collection of novel bio inks, um, including tissue print, which I've mentioned. We've got a brain print bio ink that's currently in beta testing um, with several of our collaborators. And most recently, um, we are looking for beta testers and we recently received funding to develop um, a third bio ink, which is going to be for printing cardiac tissues and delivering the morphogens that you need to make functional cardiac tissue model. Because there's been a lot of interest in that. And for those of you who work in the drug discovery space, you know that cardiotoxicity um, is a big issue when you're screening drugs. Um, so if you want to learn more, uh, Anna is our social media intern and she is amazing. Uh, she's also about to graduate with her degree in biomedical engineering from the University of Toledo, but she does an amazing job on Twitter and um, LinkedIn, as well as our, our Instagram, which I uh, found out yesterday my dad actually reads, <laughs> which is was a surprising, but um, my dad was like, you're talking at a 3D Heels event. I learned about it on Instagram, which is things I did not ever expect to hear from my dad. Um, but yeah, I'm always happy to, to talk more um, about Axolotl. And obviously, um, can't do any of this without my lab and all of my collaborators, as well as all of our funding sources. Um, our lab's been really lucky to be supported by a number of different groups um, as well. And uh, one thing I do want to give a quick shout out to is um, I'm part of the Mend the Gap collabor collaboration, which some of you may have seen on our uh, LinkedIn or other social media. Dimitri printed some really cool, uh, who works at Axolotl, he printed some um, 3D mimetic spinal cord tissues, which um, are actually being used. They're actually testing materials by injecting them into our mock spinal cords as an alternative to testing the materials in animals, which looks super cool. Um, but yeah, uh, always thanks to all my grad students and our, our funding sources. And if you want, you can follow me on Twitter. And thanks again, Jenny. And I'm happy to take any questions. So. Okay, we have a couple of questions. So, so again, please put your questions in the QA box because if we have a large volume, I won't be able to track. Um, okay, so we have a couple of questions coming in. Okay, one question is, how did you prevent cell settling during and after the printing process considering the slow gelation of fibrin gel? That's one question. And then there yeah. was another question I'll ask later, yeah. Okay, yeah, I can answer both. Um, so the way we prevented the cell settling, and um, they actually distribute pretty well through the fibrin. And then we had we spent a lot of time playing with the flow rate settings, and they are different for the different bioprinters um, to ensure that we actually get polymerization using the thrombin and genopin in an appropriate amount of time. Uh, the other thing our lab's been doing a lot of recently, which um, I probably should have been on a long time ago, um, is uh, printing into baths. So we've recently started printing into different types of baths. Um, Megan Cook, who's now with Jason Burdick's group in Colorado, who's an amazing postdoc, did, visited us. And so we will print into baths and that makes it easier because you can actually have um, some of the cross-linking agents present there and that helps polymerize that. And then um, we do use different uh, types of media depending on which uh, what we print into our tissues. We use um, a mixture of uh, neural um, progenitor media followed by brain physiology from stem cell tech in order to mature our, our brain tissues. And we use some different medias when we're actually doing our cancer model. Okay, great. Uh, Amira asked, can print 
uh, in a way to show laminar organization of a, I'm not sure, let me see, did, uh, such as brain, okay, I'm gonna read the original question because I feel like there may be a typo. Can you print a way to show the laminar organization of the brain cortical structure? Like in a, you know, in yeah. a, in a we, we haven't done that yet. Um, we mainly print like a mix of neural progenitors and then they self-organize, but it's something we're looking into more now that we've got sort of the tech organized. And also, um, well, I didn't show it today with uh, the microspheres, like we've been able to actually been able to localize certain tissues to certain regions. And that's definitely something we're, we're working on, not just in our lab, but also collaborating with Dr. Nygaard's group is actually printing different regions of the brain where we'd have like neural progenitors in one region and then also changing uh, the ratios of having like more mature neurons and astrocytes in other regions to 